I oftentimes had the lower grade. I was in the back of the class. I said, this isn't right. I'm a martial artist. I'm a leader. I'm going to learn how to study. Hello, everyone. What's happening? Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 726, with today's guest, Dr. Jerry Beasley. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I founded Whistlekick. Well, why? Because I love martial arts. I love traditional martial arts. And that's why we do all the things that we do. If you want to know what else we do besides this show, please go check out whistlekick.com. You're going to find a bunch of stuff over there, including our store, which is one of the ways that we pay the bills. And if you find something that you like in the store, you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Everything for this show is on a different website. The links, the photos, all that good stuff. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. We bring the show twice a week, and our goal here at Whistlekick is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists worldwide. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, you can do a lot of different things, including making a purchase. You could share this episode with somebody, or maybe join our Patreon. If you think the show's worth 63 cents each episode, you know, you might consider supporting us at the $5 a month tier. And there's even a $2 a month tier. Go to patreon.com slash whistlekick, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick, and you can sign up there. And if you do, you're going to get exclusive behind the scenes, bonus content, lots of good stuff that we do over there to extend the value and make sure that you stick around. And I think we do a good job because people do stick around. And if you want the entire list, all the ways you can help us in our mission, as well as a shifting, rotating mix of behind the scenes and other fun and exclusive content, go type in, you won't find a link for it, whistlekick.com slash family. Today's episode is with a, an interesting guest, someone who has approached the martial arts and their career in a way that, to my knowledge, no one else has. Dr. Beasley is actually an academic in the world of martial arts, as well as having a deep knowledge on how things actually work. He's been around, he's been training, he's trained with some of the absolute best. In fact, we've got some name drops going on in here that I think are going to impress you, at least they impressed me. And not name drops simply for the sake of dropping names, but because this man has been connected to some of the absolute best that have existed. It's a wonderful conversation. I had a great time. I'm sure you will too. So here we are. Hello, sir. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks. Good. Thank, thanks for doing this. Thanks for coming on. Hi, it's my pleasure. You have been on a list. You probably didn't know you were on a list, but you've no. been on a list for a number of years of people that I really want to make this happen. So yeah, I'm very thankful to Andrew. And th of course, even more so thankful to you. Well, it's my pleasure. What would you like to talk about today? I, I want to talk about wherever our conversation is going to, to take us. And if you're okay, I kind of just want to just want to go. Yeah, let's try that. You've been doing what you do for a while. Yes. You've connected with, uh, to my mind, just about everybody worth connecting with. But from, you... what, <laughs> from what I can tell, you're still incredibly passionate about martial arts and training. Is that a fair well, statement? No, it's not. I no. retired. Yeah. Okay. I, I just retired from Ramp University. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like any other job. When the job is over, like let's say that you are a mechanic for your whole life. Sure. When it's over, you're, you're ready to say it's over and move on to something else. I'm enjoying, loving retirement. I loved my uh, position as a professor at Raffi University, loved every day of it. Um, but when it was over, it was over, and I haven't wanted to go back. Okay. Tell us about that position then. Okay. <clears throat> Interesting story. So no college or university in America, in the U.S., um, has a, a bachelor's degree in martial arts, Asian martial arts. Okay, is, is there interest in it? Yes, but no college prepares professors to become college professors in that particular curriculum. Mm -hmm. So in other words, 
you could go to any college you want, and you might be able to get a few courses here or there in martial arts, mostly technical, mostly a, a basic karate or a basic kung fu or something like that. Um, I think there's one other uh, college, um, uh, Los Angeles City College, maybe uh, Hayward Nishioka comes to mind. Mm. I believe he has an Asian martial arts program minor. It's a minor at that the college. Um, that's the only one that I know of. I, I, I know there are some private colleges um, that are online and things like that that offer degrees. Um, it would not be much value, I don't think. Sure. Uh, in other words, if you were to get a degree online and then go to a brick and mortar college and say, can I get a job? Your chances of being accepted are pretty low, maybe zero. Um, so, so there's no real, um, real training uh, to get into colleges and become a college professor. It's something like a lot of people like to do. I mean, everyone would like to be a college professor teaching martial arts. Wow, wouldn't that be great? Yeah, it's incredible. Okay, but so how did I get it? Yeah. Well, um, is it like Highlander? Do I have to take it from you? <laughs> no, it's um, they didn't replace the position because um, they decided, well, we can't really replace you. It costs a lot of money to do go the, the route of interviewing and stuff like that. We've got other things. Let's let it go. And so it's almost 50 years, almost 50 years that I, I invested in uh, Rafa University. It's fantastic. Like I said, loved every day of it. As Bill Wallace would say, it was a blast. And it was. It was fantastic. So I was a senior at Virginia Tech. It's a wonderful college, wonderful university. Um, they have about 30 some thousand students now. When I was a student there, there may have been 12 or 15,000. Mm -hmm. um, so I go to Virginia Tech and I'm majoring in philosophy. I, I entered the college in 1970 and I finished in 73. Um, actually, 69 to 70, finished in 73. Okay, and I, um, I really liked the Asian martial arts. And so I majored in philosophy because I love that philosophy. Okay, I was also reading some Bruce Lee information where he says, I haven't created a new art, but my art can be all arts and it's bound by none. It's like water. <laughs> so as a philosophy major, I thought, oh, wait a minute. Now, how can you be all arts, but bound by none? So that really intrigued me. And so I started writing my papers in philosophy classes. They'd say, write a paper about this or that. And I tried to focus on martial arts. Um, the war uh, in Vietnam was on at the time. Um, I think it ended in 73, the year I graduated. Uh, I expected to go into the military when I graduated, but uh, the war was ended, fortunately. And um, so I decided there. it was right at the Jimmy Carter era, and um, there were no jobs, <laughs> per se. It was a low economy. Um, the oil embargo was started probably the very mm. next year. And so it was tough. So I went back to graduate school and got a master's degree in um, sociology. Well, every course that I took, if I had to write a paper, and you have to write papers for everything, um, I would study martial arts. I, I looked at the role playing. I looked at the social psychology. Um, I looked at the work as ethic of martial arts. My master's thesis was, I, I believe, it's been 30, 40 years, um, the occupational role of the sensei. So if you go back to the 1970s, the Asians were identified as martial arts masters and the non-Asians, being Americans, were considered, you can't be a master, you can only be good. Mm -hmm. Then we started having guys like Chuck Norris and um, Joe Lewis and others get into martial arts movies. And um, they really kind of put a new face, if you will, on martial arts. So they start. So non-Asians became accepted as martial arts leaders. Um, I had a wonderful time studying about it, researching uh, the masters. And when I finished the masters, I went back for the doctorate. And uh, I completed a doctorate in education administration. Mm -hmm. So I studied how martial arts schools came over from Asia with a very much a um, survival of the fittest, get rid of students that, that can't make it. And they changed that into every student can make it. 
You just have to find the way to help them do that. Of course, there's, every student has a value uh, in a martial arts school. So that was the, um, the doctorate. And then I started writing John Corcoran. Um, I, I'd sent, sent an article out to John Corcoran, who was a, one of the top writers, journalist at the time. Um, and he just was really excited about the master's thesis. And so he picked out a few articles out of that and said, write these up. And so I got back in touch with him and started writing there. This was around 1980. And um, then the most wonderful thing happened, and I believe it was 82. It was in the winter, the spring of 1982. Joe Lewis, my martial arts hero, decided to relocate to North Carolina. He was from Knightdale, North Carolina. He had been in Hollywood, as you, as you know, I'm sure, uh, doing movies and such. Um, his mom developed cancer, I believe it was, or some ailment. His dad had already passed away. She had a big farm there in uh, Nightdale. So he elected to move back and take care of her. And when he did, um, his connections in Hollywood started closing out. And so all of a sudden he was an outsider. Um, he had lost the world title. And he thought, well, gee, if I can get that back, um, I, I would like to um, like to get back into movies. And so that was always his plan. So he moved to Nightdale. My, Nightdale was maybe four or five hours from me. I immediately called him up. He was living at the YMCA. He had no money. He was living at the YMCA, um, kind of down on his luck. So I called him up. He said, yeah, of course. I said, I'd like to do an article. He said, definitely come down. So I, myself and a, and a friend drove down. And our real interest was in working out with the great Joe Lewis. So the first, uh, my, our first meeting, we talked about sparring. He said, you bring a gear? I said, of course. And so um, we put on the gear and went down in the uh, uh, YMCA can, and started can, sparring. Can we pause that story for just sure. a moment? Can yeah. you talk about your, just give us enough experience with tra- with your training up to that point that we know what, that we can, we can get a sense as to what's about to happen. Sure. What it looks like from your perspective. Okay. So after I uh, graduated from college, um, well, first of all, in college, when I started out, I had kind of low grades. Virginia Tech is a very challenging university. Mm-hmm. Um, 3.7 GPA was what was required for a long time, but they would take students from the community. I was from Christiansburg, 10 miles away. They would take students from the community and, and let us come in. And, and not be so concerned about the requirements, just as a community thing. Very few students survived it, but I was a martial artist, so I knew I was going to survive it. I did have the skills. So I would go into classes, and I'd been in a rock band, and we traveled around, and I played lead guitar, as so many martial artists do. Mm-hmm. Played lead guitar, and uh, we were traveling, and um, I didn't show up at classes very often. And so by the end of the first semester, I, I had maybe a one five GPA. That was uh, a D plus average. So um, um, I kept training in martial arts. I, I dropped out of the band. And um, um, I was also told that if my grades didn't get back up, I was going to be in Vietnam. Mm. So um, and my parents didn't want that. My dad fought in World War II. And he said when he went to war, They said, this is the final war. You're fighting now, so your kids will never have to fight. So he discouraged me from from getting in. I I was ready to go myself. So um, he discouraged me from doing that. So uh, I I dug in and worked hard. I said, you're a martial artist. I was used to, as a black belt, I was used to being at the front of the class. Mm -hmm. But in the Virginia Tech classrooms that I would take, math in particular, um, oftentimes had the lower grade. I was in the back of the class. I said, this isn't right. I'm a martial artist. I'm a leader. I'm going to learn how to study because I didn't know how to study. I knew there was a library. I knew there were books. I didn't know. I knew you had to buy the books. I didn't know you had to read them. So I found that out and got into the, um, the library, started studying. My grades went from one five to uh, three, four dean's list in no time at all. So the interviewers at Virginia Tech must have seen that I had the ability. I just didn't have the skills necessary to work out. 
not work out, but to study <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and make the grade. So I was quickly on the dean's list. And because I was on the dean's list and because I became one of the better students, then I felt that um, that's why I went back to graduate school after that. So in 1971, I earned the black belt in Taekwondo. They call it Taekwondo. It was Korean karate, Kong Sudo, Mm -hmm. or what was actually Shotokan. Um, When I was in um, Virginia Tech, there was a a guy that had like a brown belt in Shotokan. And we were comparing notes because I was a red belt, same thing at the time. And we were both doing the same system, same style, same kata. And I thought, well, wait a minute, how can you be Japanese and I'm Korean? And at the time, it was like, if you're Japanese, we don't want to associate with you. You're, I'm a Korean stylist. We don't get together. So I started working out with different people in different styles and things like that. We, we put on martial arts shows and have uh, little in-house uh, club tournaments. And um, so I'd, I was really into sparring. I was in sparring. Uh, primarily because of June Rhee. June Rhee uh, created the safety equipment in 1973, and it wasn't available to me until about 1974. But the minute we put them on the hands and feet and we started sparring, it occurred to me that all the things I'd learned were just too hard to do. You can't get in that stance and pull your hand back to your hip. So we started kind of experimenting and getting what, what was called at the time in the South, now, Virginia is considered in the South, but we're not Southern. I don't know. I, 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 live in, I live in Vermont. I've lived in New England my whole life. To, to me, pretty much everything South of Pennsylvania, even it's, Southern Pennsylvania is the South. I, I guess historically the South was Virginia, West Virginia down. Okay. And um, the North was anything about that. Yeah. Um, so um, we had the sparring gear. And I found out that it's so hard to pull your hand back at your hip each time and throw that punch. that when you have the gear on, you have to change the way you're doing these things. So I, after that, I didn't do kata. Oh, I just trained. I just trained to get a better kick, a better punch, to move more. Um, I really didn't get into tournaments except for a couple of invitational tournaments, uh, open tournaments, because I didn't have time. I was in college. Mm-hmm. And I'd found out once before, when you travel to be in a band, you, you have to give up something. So if you travel to do the circuit, you have to give up something. And I wasn't willing to do that because I was already decided that teaching martial arts was incredible. That's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I had opened the karate club at, at Radford University, 10 miles away, um, in 1973. And that's when I went to the president of Radford University. And I made an appointment and I went and approached him. I said, um, what we need here is a self-defense class, martial arts. And I guess he looked at me like, wait a minute, you don't come and tell the president of a university what we need. But at the same time, like a bell went, uh, a light went off his head and he saw, gee, this is mostly a, co- a girl's campus. That's what we need. This would be great for everyone. And physical education was required at the time. Everyone had to take three credits of physical education. So he marched me right down the hallway to the vice president um, for academic affairs, Dr. David Moore. And in life, everyone has that one person that pats them on the back and gives them the chance. And that was my one person, David Moore. Um, He said, yeah, let's make this happen. And so he talked to the PE department, they weren't interested in it, but he said, yes, you are. So they got interested in it and um, he made it happen for me. So I was teaching martial arts as an adjunct instructor, didn't have the doctorate yet, so I couldn't go into professorship, but I was uh, an adjunct um, instructor teaching martial arts. I had a karate school that I taught at. I taught, you know, different little things. Um, So it was, it had overcome me. Martial arts had taken over my life. And I was studying it at the same time. So uh, by the time I get to Joe Lewis, I was a fifth degree black belt. I had a lot of training and practice in kickboxing. Um, I I joined the Tech Boxing Club for a while under uh, Maynard Questenberry. Um, It was a very small group then. And basically, he beat us up on a daily basis. (laughs) 
um, on occasion, we would get to spar whoever showed up. And sometimes it'd be a, a golden gloves guy. And sometimes it'd be a beginner. I like the beginner days. Um, and then you get better over time. Um, but he wouldn't let us kick. One first time I sparred him, um, he let me kick. I kicked him in the face. A hook kicked him in the face. Side kicked him in the stomach. I was thinking, this is too easy. I thought this guy was good. He was going gloves. He was state champion. And um, he said, I said, well, I'm just going to punch Maynard. And so I punched him and boom, we dropped down, left hook me, liver shot, went down. So I said, okay, I've got to learn this. He would never let me kick after that. So I had had the training and the full contact sparring. I was a fan of Joe Lewis. I know that he studied with Bruce Lee. I was a fan of Joe, uh, Bruce Lee, uh, primarily the philosophy part of it. And so when I found out that Joe Lewis was going to be located in Nightdale, North Carolina. I called him up on the phone. Someone had given me his phone number. And um, I said, look, like come down and work out with you. And um, I write articles. And he apparently read one of them uh, about the history of martial arts. And I had included him not knowing him at the time. So I said, sure, come on down. So I made an appointment, came down. Uh, we talked for a while. And uh, then we sparred. If you train with Joe Lewis, that means sparring. It's not like he says, okay, get into class. He never did karate. We never did anything that resembled karate, stances or punches or kicks or anything like that. Maybe the kicks. And sometimes we often wear a karate uniform for the, um, for the visuals, for the um, videos uh, uh, and, um, and uh, photographs that we did for magazines. We would wear a karate uniform, but we never did karate. It was always kickboxing, full contact. And so from day one, um, and so you're probably going to ask, well, how did you do? I was surprised that I was able to kick him and get some punches in and things like that. But I'm sure, now he said that he hadn't sparred in seven years at the time. I may have been the first person back. No, I think he was working with some, some local guy, karate guy there. Mm -hmm. So he had not sparred in Hollywood. They told him, um, if you spar, you can you know, break a nose or something, get hurt. So he didn't spar. He didn't, um, he didn't do a lot of things there, waiting on movie roles and things like that. Mm -hmm. I found out later, by the way, uh, Joe was offered a contract, um, Universal Studios, I think it was, um, to be a, you know, a group actor, $50,000 a year in probably 1971, 72. I've heard about this, but it was TV, and he didn't want to do TV. Yeah, TV. He, yeah. He, he felt he was, the TV was... A small screen. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't want to go and, He wanted a big screen. He, TV actors seldom got a break into movies. Hmm. It just wasn't happening at the time. So he was advised not to do that. Uh, the advisor, I believe, that he, he spent a lot of time with was Al Tracy. Al Tracy... Had had hired him. I was told around hundred thousand dollars a year to go to all of the karate schools, the Tracy Kempos, and Joe didn't like Kempo at all. But he he went to all the places to teach him sparring techniques, do seminars, and things like that. And he was the number one name in martial arts at the time, seventy one. Sure. And so um, he had told him not to get in TVs, TV, but to get movies. And also, um, some people know this, that Bruce Lee in 1971 uh, concluded he wasn't going to get any major roles in, in American uh, TV and, and uh, movies. So he went to Hong Kong and they were ready to get him. When he got off the plane, there was a crowd there. He didn't know why. They were fans of the Cato show. Um, what was it called? Green Hornet. Green Hornet. They had relabeled it as the Cato show. And so... Um, he immediately got contracts to uh, to be in movies. Uh, his movies were fantastic because it wasn't the type of cinema they were used to. Instead of Bruce Lee coming out and doing the one, two, three Kung Fu cinema, he came out like, like American martial arts and sparred with his opponents. If you ever notice that, he comes out, he's moving, got the footwork, he's moving around, he's hitting, he's, he's moving back and forth, he's swinging John Wayne type of punches. Um, one of his private students had been um, um, 
what was his name? Wanted Dead or Alive. Uh, who is that guy? Number he was the number one actor for back in the seventies. Um, can't think of his name. Wanted Dead or Alive, and if you look that up for I'm me, gonna, I'm going to look it up because I, it, it, I'm. I got it. Gene Simmons. Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen? It's Steve, it's, it was Steve McQueen. Okay. Yeah. He was uh, 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 one of Bruce Lee's private students. He uh, Bruce Lee traveled with him at a few uh, movies as a personal trainer. Uh, they didn't use that term personal trainer, but he was the personal trainer. So um, he picked up Steve McQueen's uh, mannerisms and things like that. Mm. And so if you notice Bruce Lee's movies, all of his movies was an Asian Steve McQueen. Mm. So he took the number one box office actor in the U S and became that in China and all of Asia. Mm. And then that translated its popularity back into uh, U.S. So, um, um, at one point, uh, Bruce Lee had contacted Joe, uh, probably in 1970, 72, I guess. I think Bruce went back to, um, China in 1971, started acting. His movies probably came out in 72. He, he started getting a lot of authority at the movies. Mm -hmm. So he called, contacted Joe, um, and asked Joe if he would be interested in being part of one of his movies. It was Return of the Dragon. And of course, most people understand that he asked Joe, Joe turned him down and he got Chuck Norris. So that started Chuck Norris, became legendary. So um, Joe did not take it because Al Tracy said, no, don't go over there and be in a small time and get beat up and killed by an Asian actor. You've got to be powerful. And so Joe turned it down. Mm. A lot of people don't know that that was the real reason that he turned it down was because Al Tracy, there was another Tracy there and it might've been the other uh, guy. I don't think it was Al. I think it was, there was another Tracy, Tracy brothers. So uh, at any rate, um, Joe had missed that opportunity uh, to be in the movies with Bruce Lee. So here he was uh, YMCA down in his luck could have been top box office star had the, had the chops as they say. He had the looks. He had some acting skill. Um, he had the charisma. For, for yeah, he sure. had the charisma. He was a Hollywood movie star, and everyone would guarantee it. And that's probably one of the reasons that he didn't take the TV roles. He, yeah. As we mentioned, he was offered that to be in, um, uh, as a character actor for um, Universal, one of, the, one of the big companies there. And so... Um, Turned that down, uh, tried for uh, starring roles. He got the one Jaguar Lives. Um, they put it together, but then they didn't promote it. You know, they, usually the budget for promotion is, is certainly as big as the uh, budget for producing it. And they they let it go. And that kind of dropped him out. So he never got really anything. After they had some, some TV roles, had some um, opportunities, but never really amounted to much. So here he is back in... Um, Nightdale, uh, I, I was sparring all the time, so I felt pretty good about it. So how did I get to this? Well, Joe hadn't sparred in seven years, as I mentioned, as he'd been at, in Hollywood. So when he gets back, he decides to get in shape and try to get that heavyweight title back. But during those seven years, he would write an article here and there. And certainly after he won the PK-8 title in 1974, which is, by the way, the perfect example of the Jeet Kune Do that Joe learned from Bruce. Forward hand, fighting, lots of footwork, mobility, ways of attack. That's the concept of uh, Jeet Kune Do. Um, so he was kind of not, not, in, not in the best shape. He gained weight and things like that. And, um, so I, I felt like I did okay. Um, I sparred him. I, sparred, I went down there once a month for a year or so. Uh, sometimes more often, and I would see him on the road a lot. But so I, I would go down there and spar with him, and probably the second or third time, it was like a world of difference. He started training again, and he was just a phenomenal fighter, and all the things came back to him, and I couldn't couldn't touch him then. I'd be lucky to get a kick in. So, <laughs> so that's how it was going with uh, with Joe. That's that's a lot of fun, and. Clearly, in that time, you established enough of a relationship that 
you and Joe and Bill Wallace put together Karate College. Yeah. Which, can, can, you, can you talk about the origins of that? Because sure. let, let's face it, a lot of people, myself included, have tried to put together events similar to that. You putting that event together, because is it this year's 50 years, 40 years? No, no, 35, 36. 35 years, okay. Yeah. Still not, not nothing, right? Like it, yeah, right. Yeah, phenomenal. Can you, can you talk about the origins and what made it work at a time when my understanding, because I, I wasn't, I, I, was, I was quite young then. I didn't know what yeah. was going on. Sure. But my understanding of that time was that cross-training and mixing wasn't terribly popular. No, it wasn't at all. So some would say it was Lucky Star, as I count, consider it a blessing, that Joe Lewis would be there and that I would have what it takes. It was the publicity skills that I had that he was so attracted to. Mm. I'm sure it wasn't my skill. Um, but he, he had worked with John Corcoran. He'd been roommates with John Corcoran for two years there in Hollywood. Um, and in fact, uh, John was let go of his uh, position at um, CFW Curtis Wong mm -hmm. at the same time Joe decided. And so Curtis, uh, not Curtis, but uh, so John Corcoran moved back to Pennsylvania, where he was from. And so Joe was left without a roommate. His mom was sick. Hey, let's go home. So that's why that happened. That was in 1982. So I knew him for about a year. I'd, I'd, I'd go there every um, every month and spar. And also, I had an organization called IKEA, American Independent Karate Instructors Association. And we had quite a few schools. And so I tried to book seminars with Joe. And everybody wanted a seminar with Joe. Yeah. And at the time, he would do a seminar for $250. So he could do two or three in an area and move on to the next one. And he knew everybody and everybody knew him. So he, I say he was in um, um, Scranton, Pennsylvania, or is it Scranton, New Jersey? Scranton, New Jersey, I think it is. Um, he would just call the people around the area and they would say, sure, we want a seminar. And what's the price, 250? Sure, 300, then he went 500, 700. I think he finished around 1500 when he was doing seminars here a few years ago, gee, 10 years ago. Uh, in fact, Joe passed away 10 years ago, March, no, no, 10 years ago, as of August, this August, 2022. So that would have been 2012, August, end of August, August 30th. Um, so he, he could, he could uh, get seminars anywhere. Everyone wanted him to stay at their house and things like that. So I traveled around and, and would meet up with Joe in, in, in uh, one state or another. And we trained all the time. And I was taking down all these notes and writing stuff. Um, and it was getting in articles and that was making him more popular. And then he, we'd do another article and then he'd get more popular and more jobs. And so it was uh, uh, a, a symbiotic relationship that we worked together. We were real good together. His dad had been a college professor, so he sort of had an admiration for um, education and things like that. So it really worked good. Joe and I just hit it off uh, really well. And we were good partners for all the things that we did there. Everything worked. So how did Karate College happen? Well, um, once my name got out as being associated with Joe Lewis, Bill Wallace, Jeff Smith, uh, the three world champions. And at the time when they won the world title in 1974, they were the first and the biggest and the most important. And they became legends in 1974. Mm -hmm. So everyone wanted to find out about Bill Wallace and Jeff Smith and Joe Lewis. They were the big names. So um, a uh, entrepreneur in um, the Poganos of Pennsylvania um, put together a camp and he contacted me and he had Jeff Smith. Jeff Smith had worked with him before. He said, how do you get Bill Wallace? And I, um, I gave him Bill Wallace's phone number. And he got Bill Wallace. And I said, wait a minute, you need to get Joe Lewis. You got Bill Wallace, Jeff Smith. You got to get Joe Lewis in there. So he contacted Joe Lewis. Then he called me back and said, wait a minute. I don't know these guys. Will you come up and do an article? And I said, yeah, you have to pay the way, you know. So um, I went up there with them. And coming back, Jeff Smith and I were on a plane. And I said to Jeff, I said, because um, we're both from Virginia. I said, Jeff, I could do a better camp than that. He said, what do you mean? I said, I've got a college, Radford University. I said, I've got access to um, summer camp um, dormitories, uh, buildings, everything. I work there. He said, well, um, let's think about it. 
you think you could get Joe? I said, yeah, Joe will do it definitely. I said, and Bill too. You, you call Bill. I didn't know Bill as well at the time. I know Bill really well now because we've been partners for 30 some years. Yeah, 30, 35, 36 years, same as karate college. He, uh, so I said, well, I'm not going to pay you guys. We're going to go in as partners. Each one promotes it. Each one uh, gets the information out and we, each one teaches at it. And so um, we show up at the camp and I'd, we had like 250 people the first year, unheard of. But what made the camp was we had Karate Kung Fu Illustrated, um, Official Karate. There was a, a magazine out of um, uh, Florida at the time John Corcoran was with. We had Black Belt Magazine, but Inside Kung Fu. Every martial arts magazine, five or six of them, had editors or representatives there. So this was in June. So by June, July, August, by August, September, Every martial arts magazine had a big blow up, a big write up on the martial arts camp. So everybody knew about it. The next year we got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, we started having some, uh, actually some lo loss of attendance um, after at year three, when people got tired of doing the same thing. You got three champions who are going to teach you the same thing and, um, you know, mix it up a little bit. What else you got there? So I started hiring judo guys and uh, kung fu guys and things mm -hmm. like that. So the big thing on the camp was all the editors said for the first time, masters of Kung Fu, karate, judo, savat, and et cetera, were coming together. There was no fighting, no infighting. Everyone got along. Everyone respected everyone. And so that changed the way people started looking at it. Yeah. So once we started the grappling in 90, um, 90, 91, 92, I started having the grapplers come in. Then we really became a mixed martial arts uh, camp, and um, we started growing considerably. Now, the UFC didn't come about until 1993. It was called No Holds Barred. It wasn't until 1995 that Jeff Blacknick, a wrestler and a commentator for the, uh, for the UFC, was watching um, the fighters, and he said, gee, that guy's got the kicks, the punches. He's got the grappling skills. He's a real mixed martial artist. Coined the word right there. Mm -hmm. That's where it came about, 1995, Jeff Black. I believe that was in uh, Wyoming. You can tell the history, Professor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah out, you got to have these little individual things that you talk about. So, um, so we had the first real cross-training mixed martial arts type of camp. Everyone got along. Once the reputation got out, uh, we got guys like Henzo Gracie, uh, uh, got involved in it, and um, uh, Gene LaBelle's guys got involved in it. We had the top fighters, the top grapplers. Um, by the 1990s, by 1993, we consistently had 350. By 1994, 95, we had 400. Oh, one year, we had a total of 500 on these different camps. Wow. And um, it just grew and grew until about the year 2000. And then it started. Everyone was doing it. They came, they saw, this is how you do it. Well, we're going to do our own. We can't send a group this year because we're doing ours. And then the uh, martial arts um, teachers association started coming out and saying, don't go to camp, have your own camp. Yeah. Well, I mean, that would be good business for a school. If you had a school, or well, well, I, I take can your see the economics of it. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's how it was working out there. And, um, the camp is still in existence. Um, of course, we lost Joe in 2012. Um, Joe had brain cancer. And most of the people close to him uh, noticed that probably four years earlier, 2008, Bill Wallace and I were talking about this. We noticed Joe was just getting mad for no reason. He'd just get extremely upset and, and mad. He'd get mad at a person that had not done anything to him. He would confuse the, the name and the face with the, with a person. And um, he was on the internet at the time and he would write the most terrible things about people. And I mean, just guys trying to get ahead, trying to get their name on a hall of fame thing. And um, he'd cut them down and slander them. Um, and we thought, this isn't Joe, he's not like this. So uh, then he's again, and I remember in 2009 or something like that, he told um, myself and another black belt, um, Jerry, if um, if I start repeating myself or drooling, 
well, you point that out to me, won't you? <laughs> and we well, said, sure, Joe. So he knew something was wrong. So this was a couple of years beforehand. He had these headaches and vision problems and things like that. So by the time he finally um, went in in 2011 to a doctor's office, um, it, it had grown. Mm-hmm. They, they had no, no recourse. They, they did the chemo and things. And the last few pictures of him at his conference and things, he's all ballooned up because of the uh, prednisone and the cancer treatments and things. Didn't even look like himself. So it was pitiful there, but uh, he still, he leaves an incredible legacy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so what made Karate College great? Yeah. Luck. We were the first one out. We had the most interesting people. We had all the publicity come in on it, and it was all free. The publicity was, and we never dropped the ball. We kept going from there, getting the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. One thing I never did was a Hall of Fame. We never, now we have a Karate College Hall of Fame for our own instructors that have been there five to 10 years, but we never opened it up and let people come in and put them in a Hall of Fame. And that that's what some people have said. You need to do that to keep your enrollments up. So now Is it something you talked about internally? Did you talk about that with, with Bill and Joe and, and yeah. ultimately Henzo? Yeah, they were in favor of it. They're not, no. they're not paper tigers. They're real deal people. Sure. And so it just hurts so much to give a piece of paper or a certificate or something to somebody you know didn't deserve it. They just paid the price. And that's what so many of the Hall of Fames had become. Mm. Um, you probably have been nominated for dozens of them. I used to get them all the time, but I would never respond to them. Um, it's it's a money making proposition. Do the people deserve it? It's their Hall of Fame, and if they feel like they deserve it, yes, they do. But it's not a it's not on the level of you know like a black belt Hall of Fame or something something like that. Sure, sure. When when you think about what you've seen over the course of your time involved in the martial arts, quite often people will tend towards the, the negative. They bring a cynical point of view. I, I don't want to do that. I want to go the other way. Because you've been around so many people, because you've watched so much, what is going on now in the martial arts world, however you want to define it, whatever corners you want to look at, that you wish had been going on at some point in the past? Um, when I first met Joe Lewis, um, I had read his articles that he wrote for Professional Karate Magazine in 1973. And it detailed what he had learned from Bruce Lee, five ways of attack, footwork, um, lead hand, lead foot, all the things he learned from Bruce Lee. Joe practiced with Bruce Lee for uh, roughly 18 months. Um, during that time, he won 11 straight national and world champion titles. It changed Probably not coincidence. Probably not. What most people don't know, and I only learned this uh, recently in the last couple of years, um, I started contacting guys like Jerry Pennington, Jerry Smith, um, Darnell Garcia, uh, guys like this that were on the scene at the time and were the champions. And they let me know that Bruce used to go with Joe to the, the weekly sparring sessions. Bruce never sparred, but... Um, everyone accepted Bruce. He was in shape. He knew things, charismatic. So they were all happy to have him come in. Um, and he would coach Joe and he would train Joe on do this and do this. And, and, um, okay, now, uh, so and so, he'll come right at you. So you want to step and, and move. Don't, uh, you, you hit him before he hits you, you know, intercept him. So, um, he had all that training with, with Bruce and was able to write these outstanding articles in professional. Uh, Karate Magazine. Um, John Corcoran was the author, but John and I both agreed when we talked about it. Joe starts talking. If you got a um, tape recorder at the time, um, Joe starts talking. All you, the editing you do is if um, you know there's a dangling participle or or, or something like that. Joe just talks a, an article out. It just comes out straight. Mm. So what I said to Joe was, Joe, I want to learn what you learned from Bruce Lee. That's what I. That's what I'm here for. That's what I wanted. This was 1983, and um, 82. Uh, so we, when he would come up and see me, we'd spend a week just going through the material that Bruce had shown him, 
Now, Joe was never really identified with Bruce Lee. He never called himself a Jeet Kune Do instructor or practitioner, but everyone knew that he worked with Bruce Lee. Um, and Joe felt that he'd given it all new names and things like that and updated a lot of it. But the whole system of Jeet Kune Do, the five ways of attack, um, the lead hand, lead foot, the incredible footwork, the testing, you have to test your material. You can't just accept that it worked for someone in some country at some year. You have to get out there and test it, pressure test, testing the call. Um, he, he did all that. And mm-hmm. Bruce and um, uh, Linda Lee, uh, Bruce's w- uh, wife at the time, knew Joe well. I mean, they hung out. Joe was at Bruce's house all the time. Um, they they met up at different places like that. So um, she knew that they had worked together, that he wasn't necessarily a student, but a co-partner. Mm-hmm. I mean, Joe was the world champion. So um, Bruce would chisel away all the things that Joe had and get just this refined product. People used to say about Joe Lewis, Joe, you only use a back knuckle. It was a lead hand, a lead hand and a sidekick. That's all you ever use. Well, yeah, well, I went every tournament too. So, <laughs> so that was because it's not how many skills, you know, it's how many ways you can use your skills. So when, if a technique didn't work, Joe would not change techniques and go to some other system or some other technique. He would change the angle, the way he was presenting it. A good bass fisherman will tell you that if he's using a bait, okay, and it's not working, he'll change the way he's presenting it. He'll change it, get a different uh, lure or change position. So that's the secret of the fighting is each person's going to come at you a certain way. You have to know through experience how you're going to approach them with a few techniques. You don't need a dozen, 15 or 20 techniques. Bruce Lee and Joe Lewis only concentrated on basics, front kick, round kick, side kick, um, some variations of those, jab, cross, hook, some variations of those. Joe won the 1974 world title, forward hand technique, which was a ridge hand, Mm -hmm. and side kick. And he threw a round kick or two. But that was that was it. I mean, he'd throw a right cross uh, as well. He fought off right side, fought off left side. He was equally gifted on either side. So it wasn't that he had a dominant side. So that's what I was interested in is um, the Jeet Kune Do. And um, I have no idea where we went from there, how we got there. but <laughs> That's okay. Well, one of the most interesting things I ever heard as I, I because of the show, got to meet, ultimately train with and uh, hear a number of things from Bill Wallace was uh-huh. the way he talks about Joe Lewis's psychic. You know, most people look at Bill's fighting career and, and what he was able to do with a psychic. And so to me, yeah. and I think to so many others, to hear him, man with a, an impeccable, even still, sidekick, say yeah. Joe Lewis had, had the best sidekick I ever saw. I, I can't think of a better compliment. Okay, so if you're doing Jeet Kune Do the way Bruce and Joe set it up, it's not just a technique. It's not just a sidekick. It's you have to train until you can throw the most powerful sidekick possible, the fastest sidekick possible, and the most deceptive sidekick possible. Mm. Okay, You also have to be accurate. So Joe would train hour after hour throwing a sidekick, 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 sidekick. All these techniques, same with Bruce. They would train a few techniques, but when they did it, it was better than anybody else. Mm. Look at Bill Wallace. Bill Wallace throws round kick, side kick, hook kick, back fist, cross hook, and hook. And hook. Sometimes, you know, he'll throw a right cross. Um, that's what he throws. Yep. But he is the fastest possible. He's a little muscle. Um, he was a wrestler. He all built and strong. Okay. He can take, he, he got the tenacity. One thing I can say about Joe and Bill, I've seen them really, really mad and you don't want to be around them. <laughs> they, they've got just focus and they've got an intensity about them that, gee, it's tough. I mean, it, so Joe Lewis, the sidekick, people would question it. I mean, he stomps the floor and then he hits you, but it's how he hits you. People would run. 
when they saw this sidekick coming at them, they would run out of the ring. Look at Bill Wallace fighting Joe Lewis. That's a great fight. <laughs> Bill, Bill gets his technique and then, oh, he's out of there. So it's that kind of stuff. It, it's the, when you first started talking about it, it, it reminds me of the probably the, the second most famous Bruce Lee quote. I fear not the man who knows 10,000 kicks, right? But yeah. the man who's practiced one 10,000 times. Yeah. And there, there really sounds to be the implementation of that. Do, do you think, I had this wondering as, you were, as you're talking about the relationship between the two of them, it almost sounds like Bruce was working out some of what he was trying to figure out through Joe. Oh, yeah. Joe was the test tube. Yeah. Uh, Ted Wong, who, who trained with both of them at the same time, um, and you Joe well and you Bruce well. He said Bruce always considered Joe the test tube. He was the guy that went out and I mean they would they would go to the Chuck Norris studios there in uh, Southern California. Um, I'm not that familiar with the towns, but um, um, there were four or five of them that had the Chuck Norris schools, mm-hmm. um, and they would train on Thursday, as I recall, was a sparring night, and Joe would always take um, Bruce to that, and they would they would train. Everyone watched them train. Um, uh, Bruce was kind of the coach and um, they would go out and Joe would spar with everyone. I mean, they would spar 20, 30, 40 rounds on a given night. Um, so, so it was that kind of intensity and, and training like that. Yeah, it's very much, Joe was very much Jeet Kune Do. Later on, Joe turned more to sport and kickboxing, sport kickboxing, and out of the self-defense aspects. But Joe, that's probably because Joe never really had to defend himself much. Who's going to fight a Joe Lewis? I mean, the intensity in his eyes is just yeah. enough to make it go the other way. Yeah. Mm. Now, Bill Wallace has basic Jeet Kune Do. Forward side, he's, he's got the build to do it mm. and the ability to do it. See, it's the strategy and the attributes. The strategy is, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to throw a round kick, side kick, then move in. Okay. Um, but you have to have the attributes. Bill's got that. He's got that muscle development. He's got the speed, power, deceptiveness. He's he's probably, if Joe was named the greatest fighter of all time, and Bill may well have been, may well be the greatest of all time. I mean, they, they admired each other. They were such good friends. They would have arguments every now and then, but good friends have arguments. Joe got mad at me from time to time. But good friends have arguments. They challenged each other, was my understanding. They made each other better. They did. They did. Yeah. So the the question I had asked, and and I want to go back to it, because, you know, I asked the question and we got some wonderful stories. So I'll ask a question (laughs) again, and maybe we get more wonderful stories. Let's do it. Because the martial arts landscape has changed, because things are done differently now than they used to be, are there things that you see being done today that you say, I'm glad that changed. I'm glad this is different now. This is a better way to whatever. Yes. It's a better martial arts world and environment out there now. And the hmm. MMA had a lot to do with it. The MMA had a lot. It was the testing ground. Hmm. It showed these techniques work. Those techniques don't work. The karate started off strong and powerful. And everyone understood because we only knew a few techniques, side kick, round kick, back kick. We knew some basic ne- techniques and we would work for hours. My first class in martial arts uh, as a Korean karate. Karate was the name. You didn't have anything else. You could call it Korean or Chinese or Japanese but it was or American, but it was karate. Mm. Um, we, when our, my first class was two hours, we would do every technique we knew 30 times right side, 30 times left side. The training was incredible. It was a survival of the fittest. Mm. You start off with 30 people. Within a few practice sessions, you're down to 15. And then you're down to 10. Out of the um, 30 or 40 that started with me, myself and one other guy made black belt. Mm. Uh, so that was the expectation back then. So it was simple and direct. And then we got all these shysters coming in with the death touches and um, and the fake techniques and stuff like that. And, and the the public didn't buy into it. They didn't agree. Yeah, you can kill me in 10 different ways. They didn't agree to that. 
And then the kickboxers came along and, and uh, oh, they tried their best to get Joe Lewis when he started kickboxing in 1971 to quit. Um, then no one would fight him because he beat everybody that showed up in front of him, knocked him out in the first or second round. So um, uh, they, they no one wanted the competition from the other arts. So looking back on it, if the karate people had not become such showboats and not allowed people that didn't earn a black belt to be black belts, it would be very powerful, but they didn't do it that way. It became the dojos and all that things. And you have people like getting black belts that don't deserve it. They don't have the skill to deserve it. Um, and so when MMA came along, it kind of overcame karate. Now, karate has a bad name like ineffective by a lot of people, general public. Mm -hmm. If you go to a college campus, no one wants the karate club anymore. They want to join the MMA or the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu club. Okay. Or some will do the kickboxing. Kickboxing hurts. <laughs> so um, that's what we're looking at right now. It's all fantastic. But my recommendation would be, be simple and direct. You know, Bruce Lee had a great idea, simple and direct. Okay, learn to adjust, be like water. You know, if you're presented with one type of energy, move around it. Mm. Another type of energy, move around it. A lot of people, now even Jeet Kune Do has its growing pains. Uh, one school of thought uh, felt that Jeet Kune Do was a research technique. You, you, take, you learn different martial arts systems, uh, Filipino, Indonesian, anything but karate. Um, and you mix those together so you can flow from one art to another art, and they call that Jeet Kune Do or Jeet Kune Do concept. Uh, another school of thought on Jeet Kune Do is that um, it's really Wing Chun, you know, the, the Wing Chun skills. You just, you learn the Wing Chun skills and, and you change the footwork and then you got Jeet Kune Do. Mm. So it's obviously not that. But if you have to say that your art, give it a name other than Jeet Kune Do, it's probably not Jeet Kune Do. The Bruce Lee, Joe Lewis Jeet Kune Do was simply fighting. It was taking a few techniques and testing them and refining them so that it worked in every situation. If a guy goes to war and they issue him a, um, a rifle, that rifle has to help him stay balanced. It has to fight off the enemy. It has to be able to shoot fast and slow. It has to be accurate. It shoots long and short. He's got one weapon. He's got to use it. Right. So that was the whole idea. And it's like they missed this point. Um, a lot of it was pulled from fencing. Fencing has one weapon. They don't get to put that weapon down and say, well, I think I need an ax for this one. <laughs> and the next guy comes on. Oh, I, I think I need a, a samurai sword for this guy. It's one weapon. You got one weapon. You use it for every situation. Bruce and Joe understood that you have a few weapons. What are the universal weapons? A jab, cross, hook. Every art has a jab of some type, a hook of some type. Every art has a front kick of some type, a side kick of some type, a round. Bruce called it a hook kick. Um, of some type. So my art could be all arts, but not bound by any art. So it starts making sense. Did it take me a few years to do that? Yeah, it took decades to figure it out. Constantly testing, constantly researching, constantly talking. Hmm. Okay. But that's what Jeet Kune Do was intended to be. That's why Joe Lewis never changed it. Um, he always did Jeet Kune Do. He, again, adapted more into a kickboxing in the last 20 years of life uh, as he was teaching. Um, and then toward the end, it was kind of a mixed martial art. But in the beginning, it um, you look at the 74 uh, world title and beyond that, he was doing straight Jeet Kune Do. He was in a karate tournament. Oh, then it can't be Jeet Kune Do. Yes, it was. Straight Jeet Kune Do, Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do right there for everyone to see. So simplicity is the key to that. So if I look at the landscape of martial arts, I applaud everyone, even the McDojos. I mean, it's, I'm not against them, anyone. Um, again, I'm 71. I've had a wonderful career, 50 some years. I did everything that I wanted to do. I met some of the best people. I, I know that if Bruce Lee was still alive, I would be working with him personally. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I've had just incredible opportunities. Uh, it, it was a blessing, and um, but do I want to go back and do it anymore? No, I'll probably end karate college. Um, COVID kicked us out of one year, and then the second year, people were afraid to come back and get that close contact. Yep. And it sounds like this year, 
the gas prices are going to be so high, a lot of people that would like to do it are going to be unable to do it mm. because it would cost so much just to get here from out of state. So um, I will probably retire it this year, 2022, although I'll maintain the name and we might just have a Bill Wallace seminar every year and call it Karate College, mm. but it won't have all the promotion but, and all the difference. So what, what you're saying is 2022 may be the last year. You're doing uh, it this it, year? It's the last year. It's the last I'll still year. Use the, I'll still okay. use the Karate College. As far as a camp is concerned, this will be the last big production with all the different people. But after this, I'll continue having uh, Joe, um, Bill Wallace and a number of dedicated people that just like to come back and, and do it. And we'll have the same intensity of things, but it'll be a smaller camp. We're not trying for the couple hundred anymore, 50, 100 people. That's, that made a good camp. And if people want more information on Karate College, where do they go? It's called thekaratecollege.com. The, T-H-E, thekaratecollege.com. And it give you all the information on who's here and things like that. And is there anything else people should have? Website, social media, email, anything else that would be relevant to them as they... See, I'm not trying to your... sell anything. Sure. So I don't have a lot to... I'm working okay. on a new book on Jeet Kune Do. I'm going to talk about the G, the, the real Jeet Kune Do from Joe Lewis. Oh, cool. Bruce Lee okay. and Joe Lewis. And... and, and where are you pulling that information from? Like, it does, it does not surprise me, yeah. especially after hearing what you've said today, because you've talked about things related to Jeet Kune Do. I've never heard. Mm-hmm. But there are there is a, a strong group out there that thinks everything never say about Jeet Kune Do has been said. But no. if there's anyone who has the aptitude to pursue something historically, in an mm-hmm. academic sense, kind of the intersection of all your skill sets and passions, right? Yeah. But you, where, where, where's this stuff coming from? I go back to um, being that student sitting in philosophy class and absorbing the J. Krishnamurti and different philosophers and different religious aspects to uh, martial arts. And I think Bruce Lee intrigued me. He said, using no way as way, what does that mean? And it took 50 years to figure it out. Now, you might say, well, why didn't you just go to the guys that were in the Chinatown school that were working? Well, I did. Each one had a different view. It's like the, um, the blind men and the elephant. Three blind men go into a room. There's an elephant. They each get to touch him. They ask the one blind man, what is, it? What is an elephant? Well, it's like a, a roof, a ceiling. It's, it's just all over the place up there. He obviously touched the stomach. Another one says, um, it's like a big hose. It, it, it moves around and, and air comes out of it and water. He, he was on the trunk. And the third guy says, it's like a whip. It's a bam. It hits you so fast. He was at the tail. See, so the people that worked with Bruce Lee, just about everyone came out with a different opinion of what they learned because Bruce approached each person differently. It's like a conversation. You know, you've talked to a lot of people here. Each one, and you talked about martial arts with each person. Each person has a little different take on what they learned. Absolutely. So um, that's the way it was with Bruce Lee. Are any of them wrong? No, they're all correct. If they work with Bruce Lee and they're telling you, this is what Bruce Lee taught me. This is what I feel like I learned from Bruce Lee. So I'm going to talk about what Joe Lewis learned from Bruce Lee and what I learned from Joe Lewis. And much of what I learned from Joe Lewis was not what Joe would say, but what he would constantly do. Over and over, he would go back to the same principles, the same ideas. Joe didn't really talk about Jeet Kune Do. He didn't really do seminars on Jeet Kune Do. He wasn't really interested in being affiliated with Jeet Kune Do because it was identified with these other things. And he couldn't. He felt Wing Chun was not something he had any interest in. He said Bruce taught him, Mike Stone, Chuck Norris, that, um, you know, some Wing Chun, and they would go to parties and they would, you know, trap hands and things like that. Party favors, they called them. They didn't take it serious because they didn't need to. They had something else that was better that worked for them. And that's part of it right there. Finding out what you do best. Would it be terrible if you were a short little person uh, maybe a five foot five, 220 pound person, and you went into a Taekwondo school and they tried to teach you the jump spinning kicks, wouldn't work. 
You wouldn't be probably, able to probably do not it. a very fun day one. No, not a fun day at all. Or if you were very mild and timid and you went to a boxing club and they hit you, probably wouldn't work. Or you just didn't feel good about hanging on to another man, getting on the floor and tossing around. And so Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu might not be your cup of tea. That doesn't mean you can't capitalize on your attributes and find a strategy that works best for you. And that's what Jeet Kune Do is. And this, the real strategy is simplicity. Now, I don't consider myself to be a Jeet Kune Do instructor. I've never had a Jeet Kune Do school and try to teach people Jeet Kune Do. Occasionally, a, um, a seminar promoter will say, can you talk about Jeet Kune Do? Or an interviewer would say, can you talk about Jeet Kune Do? Or a uh, martial arts editor would say, hey, will you send me an article on Jeet Kune Do? I'll do that. But Jeet Kune Do is just all over the place. You, know, you talk to 10 people and you got 10 views of what is Jeet Kune Do. So this is what Joe learned. Um, but he didn't really say he learned this. He would do it over and over. And he would say, this is what Bruce taught me. But he didn't call it Jeet Kune Do. Is there a timeline for that book? Um, I have 80% of it down. Okay. Um, I have to find a publisher. The first thing you want to do is get a publisher before you sure. finish it, because um, otherwise they may say, well, we like to have more of this and less of that. So they cut down on your writing time. Yep. But I, I've written my whole life, so it's easy to do, and I can stamp them out pretty, pretty easy. COVID killed a lot of things. Printed material is not something used to be anybody wants a book. Now you have to shop from one to another to find a, a, an artist. Um, Yang's Martial Arts Academy. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. They're out in a lot of bookstores. They do a good job of publishing. I do. Um, so I, I have talked to them, but I, I, COVID hit and we didn't do anything for a while. So um, I'll, I'm going to start back. I just retired. I've been getting used to the freedom. People say, well, don't you get lonely? Can you find anything to do? And I say, remember when you were working, you got a day off? The rest of my life is like a day off. Every day, something new, something different. I'm just, I love working, teaching. I don't want to do the martial arts anymore. I just like being, doing what I like to do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is going back to what made you happy as a kid mm -hmm. and, and doing those things. And that's what I'm doing. So keep in mind, we've got a bunch of martial artists listening all over the world, different levels of experience, different styles, ages, goals. What, what would you say to them as we, as we close up here? Be honest with yourself and train hard. I mean, the guys that um, I've worked with, Joe Lewis and Bill Wallace and such, uh, these guys are super athletes. Um, I used to spar 15 rounds three times a week. Um, I mean, we were hardcore. We would pad arms and legs and head. Anything you wanted to hit with, you had to pad it. And we would just go out and try to knock each other down. There's that sense of when you're sparring, you go full force. You want to take the guy out. But when you have that opportunity, you pull back. And it's hard to do because that's where you build what's often called the killer instinct. Killer instinct comes about not something you can just turn on. You can't turn on killer instinct. Killer instinct comes about when you're out and you're hitting and you're, and you're, and you're hitting and bam, you can feel the contact and, and you're back and you know you've got the guy and you've, got, you've overpowered him. That's the killer instinct. You want to finish it. You want to finish the fight. If a dog captures a cat and bites him, you would think, well, he bite him, tell him to get away. But once he tastes that blood or once he gets that, that feeling of pain, killer instinct comes in. He's got to tear mm. him up. So um, that's what killer instinct is. It's not something you can just turn on. I know there was a popular video, how to turn on your killer instinct. You can't do that. You can, what you've got to, in, killer instinct is going to come about. What you got to do is turn it off. You got to be able to turn it off to save your partner. And there's a certain amount of trust. You know, all the times I spar with Joe and we sparred hard, um, I, I had this sense that he's not going to kill me. <laughs> You know, not because I could stop him, but because he wouldn't take advantage. He seldom hit me in the head. It was always, he loved the body shots. He loved a liver shot, see you go down. You can't get up. You can't breathe. So that, You're not that's the first person I've heard that from. That's why I'm laughing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he was like that. 
So um, my word to other people would be train, be honest, train hard, sweat, you know, and test. Pressure testing is what, what I, I refer to as evidence-based. Don't just say, well, this technique works because uh, Masoyama used it and uh, killed a bull. Well, he didn't really kill the bull if you go back and, and look at that. He broke the horn off and the bull bled to death over a period of an hour or several hours. So there was no killing the bull. Um, so um, just because someone says that this works or it was this, this, um, this army defeated this army because they had this skill, that doesn't mean you have the skill. You know, I, if, if you have a grandfather that was a mathematician, that doesn't mean you get the mathematician mathematician mentality, okay? People are going to be different. So you train the skills. Um, fewer techniques is a lot. Fewer techniques performed a lot of different ways. It's always going to be better than a lot of techniques performed a few ways. We In martial arts, we become too specialized. We, we want to have so many techniques. I got a technique for this. I got a technique for that. What's your technique for that? And we just like to get together and exchange techniques. Now, that in itself is artistic and wonderful and great. and Nothing wrong with that, but it's not realistic. It doesn't make you walk down the street and know that you can handle a, a technique. It doesn't make you feel like, gee, if I get hit, I'm not going to die. And that's the big thing you have to get come over. And that's get over. And uh, that's why it's so important to spar with someone your own level with protected gear. And Bruce Lee said over and over again, the highest level of training is full contact sparring with equipment. Or he called it freestyle sparring with equipment, put on the gear and you go to it. I mean, we did takedowns. We did everything when you stand up. We really didn't do ground fighting. It wasn't popular at the time. Um, and um, we would have done it if, it if it was something we knew to do at the time. But um, anything that, that you could throw, spinning elbows, anything, we did them and we, we drilled them until we got them down. So it was a wonderful way to train. Uh, is everyone interested in that? Obviously not. And there's nothing wrong with being a kata person or just wanting to be a, uh, a library, uh, mm -hmm. a vocabulary, learn everything you can and just keep it up. Uh, uh, Dan Inosanto is, people call him a, a library. I mean, he he is skilled at every martial arts system. I mean, and he's still going. No martial, yeah, that he's still not skilled going, at. Still learning. But in, for self-defense, Skill, being skilled in performing a technique doesn't mean you can use it. See, I mean, he's 84. No one would expect him to be able to defend himself against a, a big rough attack, attacker. So you have to keep those things in mind. Uh, when you get older and train, you got to do the basics of the weightlifting and the walking or the, probably not running, but walking, keeping the cardio up, keeping the muscle uh, tone in there. That's what you have to work on more. I know all the techniques, but what I have to work on is just the basic uh, muscle toning and the cardio, and that's what I try to do. Nutrition becomes more important to you then. Um, that's why I'm, when I see martial arts movies, I'm just not interested in them. I think you guys had asked me to be on this show once before, and I said, I got some other things to do. <laughs> you know, like uh, there's a movie coming on or something. Um, so I'm not that interested in um, in the martial arts anymore. I like talking to people about it. And this has been a good show. And you've done a wonderful job getting stuff out of it. Like I said up at the top, this was an episode where we talked about not only Dr. Beasley, but the wonderful people he got to meet and train with and the way that they engaged with each other. Something that I appreciate about him is, is the academic approach that he takes, not just to martial arts, but how martial arts exists, how it connects us, right? And I'm using that word intentionally, connect, educate, and entertain if you've been around for a while with this show. And it's something that I think he and I have in common. I have always admired him for the work that he has done and the approach that he has taken to martial arts. So having him on the show has been an absolute honor. Dr. Beasley, thank you. Thank you for your time, for your kindness, for your openness. I appreciate it. Listeners, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes. Every episode has a page all to itself with photos, transcripts, and even more. While you're over there, you can sign up for the newsletter so you can get notified on the cool things that we're doing. And if you want to support us in the work that we've got happening, you've got a number of options. You could leave a review 
on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Facebook, Google. You could buy a book on Amazon. We've got a bunch of books over there. Or you could help with our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you want me to come into your school, teach a seminar, I'd love to do that for you. We're still booking throughout the year. We just added a few more dates. And let's make it happen. Let me know. If you want to get a hold of me, the best way is email jeremy at whistlekick.com. Don't forget that we've got the code podcast15 to save you 15% at whistlekick.com on anything in the store from shirts, pants, uniforms, uh, protective equipment, lots of good stuff there. If you've got guest suggestions, we want to hear it. Our social media, everywhere you can think of is at Whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.